Well, good morning. Glad you're joining us today, Germantown Christian Center. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis, and well, we're glad you're taking your time out of your day today to be uh, spending it with us. We just want to remind you again, we'd love to see you in person. We're meeting here, as you know, 930 and 1030 Sunday mornings and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Well, if you've been tuning in the last several weeks, you know we've been looking at some areas of encouragement. Because after all, I want to come to church and get encouraged. How about you? I mean, you, you don't come to church being told how bad you are and how, how terrible you are because that's not what God thinks about you. God says that you are indeed a blessing, that he is willing to die for you. And he did so through his son Christ. And you know what? We have excitement about knowing that he is with us, in us, and works for us in the name of Jesus. So any of it, we're going to take some time today to encourage you a little bit about what you and I can do practically to really surrender and receive the will of God. I want to be in the will of God. I'm, I don't know about you, how many have ever made decisions and later you look back and said, I'm, that wasn't God's will. Anybody ever done something that you look back and you thought, I blew that one for sure. Sometimes you're in the middle of it, you know, this isn't God's will, what I'm doing right now. Then you got to make a decision. What are you going to do about it? Well, I want to share some practical things you and I can set ourselves up for where we can more, more often be in the will of God as opposed to looking back saying, I sure blew this one. And of course, you know, you always got somebody in your life willing to tell you, you're right, I told you so. And you know, and you know what a joy that is, right? Having somebody in your life telling you, I told you so. Not. Anyway, so in that respect, let's turn open to the Bible, if you don't mind, to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Some practical ways we can know the will of God. And you know, folks, we looked at it, we've encouraged you, we looked at the area of the book of Romans, and we talked to you about how that in the beginning of the book of Romans, we have doctrine, instruction, things that, you know, just t teaching you, you know, this is the will of God, this is, this, this is what it is. And then later in the book of Romans, you have some practical application. Here's how you do it. And so it's important that we take what we know and then adapt it and apply it to our lives. It's one thing to say, hey, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, and that's great, but how do I do that? How do I go ahead and say, well, I know I'm not supposed to say, well, how do you, uh, how do you adapt that into your life? Well, then you've got to begin to associate and think about it. What will I do when I have to go into my office or into, into work and I see this person that you know doesn't like you too well, and frankly, the feeling may be mutual, and they smart off to you. How are you going to respond? You need to prepare yourself for the challenges that you know you're going to face because there's enough of them you can't prepare for naturally because you don't know what you're going to face. So position yourself when you know you're going to face something and you, you, you know that it's there, God reveals it to you or you have knowledge of it, set yourself up for success. Be prepared. You know, we talked about this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. One of the best things you and I can do every day is to rejoice in the Lord and be glad about it. Why don't you embrace the day and everything that it has? Don't embrace, embrace the day of like, man, I know some bad stuff's going to happen today. Why don't you stop that and start using your faith and say, Lord, I'm tendering. I'm giving you this day, and I'm asking you to use my life and chart my decisions, chart my actions, chart my steps, pattern them after what you want them to be. I'm giving you permission to use me. A lot of times in life what happens is we find ourselves in a position of being aimless, wandering about, because we haven't decided the direction that we're going to be taking in the beginning. If you just start to set out, and I know we've all done it before, you've gotten in your car, and you, you start driving, and you're, you're thinking about other things. Next thing you know, you're, you're going somewhere you, you, you didn't need to go. You know what I'm saying? You're, you, you get a pattern. If you always go to work a certain way, you get in your car, you're driving, not thinking about it, it's Saturday, and next thing you know, you're on the road to work. And you're sitting there thinking, what am I doing? I don't need to go to work today. Y you were going to go to Kroger. Well, then why am I going this way? It's because you're not thinking. There's not a purposeful choice and decision. You're not embracing the day. You're letting things just come as they are. And sometimes in life, what happens is some of the old patterns, the old ways that we used to be start creeping in when you're not being deliberate about trying to chart a new way of living. That's why sometimes your mouth gets the best of you. Come on, tell the truth. How many sometimes know that, that, you know, as the Bible said, you're supposed to have your cup running over, not your mouth? How many have had your mouth start running over at times and you're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, make it stop. No, you have to make it stop. Isn't that right? Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. 
Paul the Apostle urges us by the help of the Holy Ghost. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. In other words, you must have all received a calling. You all have received a calling. You know, folks, we are called by God to do something every day. Once you embrace that, you might start asking, what is it you've called me to do today? Me be in a situation where you say, well, I, I don't really know. I don't perceive it. Well, then what, what are you called to do today? What, what are you doing today? Well, let's say you're going to work. You're called of God to go to work. Fine. Then be a blessing there. You know, isn't it amazing that if you're not careful, you can stir up so much strife? How many, how many know that... How many of you know, how many have ever had this happen? You came home, everything's great, you're in a great mood. You walk in the door, and one of your kids isn't in a great mood. Next thing you know, all sorts of strife is getting stirred up. And you're asking yourself, what just happened? Anybody ever have that happen? It's like calm seas turns into a tempest. You ever gone into work, everything seems great, and somebody just acts out carnally. Next thing you know, everybody's all stressed out at each other, and you're like, what just happened here? It only takes one person. The other thing is, it only takes one person to go ahead and calm the storms of life, too. If you remember correctly, you know, Paul the Apostle found himself on a, on a, on a particular boat that wasn't doing too well, and it was being tossed about and everything else, and he prayed, and all of a sudden, God sent an angel down and told him, you know, everything will be fine. Said, you know, they're, they're going, they're going to some, some things are going to happen, but you know what? Every life, every life is going to be fine as long as they stay on the boat with you. And, you know, he got up there and told everybody, sirs, I've had an angel stand before me right now and told me everybody's going to be fine as long as you stay on this boat. So stop trying to jump in the water over there. You stay here. And guess what? Everybody was. It takes somebody to stand up and speak faith in the response to what God has told them. That's why it's important to know the will of God. You can actually help others and inspire others to do right, live right, and be right because you are someone who listens to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. So it says that, that he's urging us to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. The word here means to call near or to invite. I don't know. I think we need to do that ourselves. He makes this plea in the light of God's mercy. The original word here used, as it were, for mercy actually is plural and refers to God's multitude of mercies. Can we all agree God is a multitude of mercy, God? Okay, you say, well, what, what is, describe mercy. Okay, how many are glad for amazing grace? You know the song, you've all sung it, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves someone like me. Aren't you glad? Okay, grace is the fact that you get something you don't deserve. Y'all like that, don't you? How about mercy? You know what mercy is? Mercy is, I'm boiling it down to you, is you don't get something you deserve. How many are glad you don't get what you, that you deserve? I mean, I'm just asking. Now, I've, I've had people demand, I want what I deserve, and I'm sitting in the back saying, no, no, you really don't. Isn't that right? You know, it kind of reminds me of a story one time, a, a gentleman went to a, a photographer, and he, he took, and they gave him the pictures back in the day where you actually had to sit in front of a photographer and they took pictures and it was on film and they develop it and you come back and they give you the pictures. You know, nowadays everything's digital. You see instantly. But anyway, he, he came in for the, and they gave it to him. He looked at these pictures, he says, these are terrible. He said, these pictures do not do me justice. And the photographer said, listen to me. You do not want pictures that do you justice. What you want is mercy. And see, one time said we have an opinion of ourselves of one thing, but we need to view ourselves and recognize, you know what? In the absence of God, you can't do something with that. You know what I'm saying to you? You can sit all you want to and claim, I want my privileges. I want my, I, I want my this. I want, but no, what you want is you want mercy. And you and I need to be people who are not only asking for mercy, but dispensers of mercy to others. If you want to be in the will of God, you've got, and you've got to make the effort to be a merciful Christian. Be somebody who is looking to dispense mercy to others. In other words, you deserve it, but I'm not going to give it to you in that sense. You all know what I mean, right? Don't sit there and think that you yourself are better than everybody else. Because truth of the matter is, all of us have our warts and failures. Because we're not perfect yet, are we? I said, are we? 
You ought to be in the will of God, be somebody who is appreciative of the fact that you're still a work in progress yourself. Yeah, under construction. Isn't that right? John Calvin, you all know who John Calvin is, right? You heard, you know, John Calvin. Okay, great theologian of the past. He, he made this statement, I, I wrote it so I wouldn't misquote it. He said that, uh, once said this, he said that we will never worship with a sincere heart or serve God with unbridled zeal until we properly understand how much we are indebted to God's mercy. We are indebted to God's mercy. I said we are indebted to God's mercy. Every day you live your life, you have no idea how much God is covering for you. Right? It's, it's, it's like, let's be honest. How many, how many times today did you do something wrong and you didn't even know it? How many of you drove here? Did anybody here exceed the speed limit by even a half a mile an hour? I'm not asking for hands. I don't want to see those hands. You know what I mean? Wide open. Wide open. Amen. Okay, well, and you got a fast car too, so I'm not even going. So, so what ends up happening is you're sitting and saying, see, it's like every one of us is in a situation where we need God to cover us. Right? And so one of the things I want to impart upon you is this, is realize, as it were, that we need to walk in love. And one way we can do that is to be merciful to others because we need mercy ourselves. Isn't that right? Okay, anyway. Let me give you another scripture that might help you. Out. And I'm going to quote this so you don't have to look. Micah 7, 8. Micah 7, 8. It says, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You know, God delights to show mercy. You know, God actually enjoys. He's looking, he's looking for a way to, to show you mercy in your life. I like that. Amen. Lamentations 3.22 puts it this way. Another Old Testament scripture. It said here, it says, um, though the Lord's mercy, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions never fail. God never fails in his compassions. You say, well, how do I fully express my surrender to God to get in his will? Let me, let me give you a couple quick keys. We're not going to be here long today. Number one, make the decision to offer your body. You ever notice you offer your body in a lot of different ways to a lot of different things, even to a lot of different folks that, that you need to be more concerned. I need to offer my body to God. Now, how do you do that? Well, you ever notice that where you are, your body normally goes? Isn't that right? How many have ever, how many have ever, how many have ever committed to do something and your body's telling you when it's time to do it? You don't want to do that. Just, you know, just stay there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, I've told funny stories over the years of all the things that, you know, and we've all done it, you know. It's amazing how many times we make a commitment for the future. Thinking that, oh, it's a month away. That's a month away. Let me just, let me clue you in. A month will come. Yeah, you know, right now a month seems like a long time away. But guess what? You keep getting up in the morning, a month is going to come around. And when it does, what you promised to do is going to come around. And this is going to be a decision you've got to make. And that's when you need to look back. I've already made the decision. Let me, let me, something that just comes to mind. Years and years ago, when, you know, my wife and we've been married now, what, 39 years, haven't we? I'm, I'm stating it's not a question, a long time. And, and honestly, it only feels like 39 minutes underwater. But anyway, um, Anyway, but what ends up happening is that, that you know, years ago, my, my wife and I, we were, we were talking, and she commented that there was a, a family that, you know, when they were going to church and all that, had asked her father, who's, you know, with the Lord now, good godly man, he, he was a really godly man, and um, asked him, I said, uh, you know, was they always know that they're, they're, you know, they're two kids, and you know, they, they all come to church, everybody's in church, and he's like, how do you get your kids and your family to come to church with you? It's like you're here every, I mean, you're just here every Sunday, and, and I guess even during the week, you're always here. I mean, how do you, and he goes, you know, he was just, he said, what do you mean? We just, 
we're having trouble getting our kids to come to church. And I guess the response he gave this guy says, well, it's really not difficult. We, we don't give them a choice. We tell them, you're coming to church. And he said, we've already made up our mind what we're going to do, that we're going to church. We don't make that choice on Saturday night or Sunday morning. We've already made that choice, and it's in effect. So sometimes you've got to make a decision that is not revisited. Sometimes you revisit a decision, and then you have an opportunity for other voices to tell you or influence what you're going to do now. Now, let me bring it down to practice. How many times have you ever gotten a situation where you're like, you know, I, I need to cut back my desserts? Anybody ever said you need just to cut back desserts? Yeah. I'm asking, anybody ever, anybody ever thought that? <laughs> thought about it? Anybody ever thought about it? I didn't say you did it. I just haven't ever thought about it. You're like, you know, I need to cut back on my donut consumption. Instead of two dozen, I need to cut back to one dozen. Anybody ever know what I'm Okay. Anyway, so you, you sit there. Well, you ever notice that when you when you that then you say, This is what I'm gonna do. I am I'm gonna forego sweets or whatever it might be. Then then what happens when lo and behold, you know, Sister Deborah makes you a, a, a beautiful chocolate cake or a, or or something and oh here I, I just had it on my heart to bless you. Or, or here's, oh, you know, I was, I was passing the cupcake shop and thought of you, and, and here's 12 dozen cupcakes. You know, something, you know. <laughs> then you sit there, well, I can't let them go to, go to waste. Right? How many times have you been at a restaurant, and they come and they bring you a free dessert? Now, you have to eat it. It's free. You don't want to hurt their feelings, right? I mean, it's free. That must be God. That must be the will of God. That, that it's free. Not free of calories, it's just free. What I'm saying is, you and I will then have to, re now if we're not careful, we're revisiting our decision. And that's a problem, because once you start revisiting it, then you might be able to not make the decision you need to make. See, we have to be determined that what we decided we stay true with. Right? That's what gets people in trouble in their marriages when they revisit certain decisions and get, you know, confused about maybe they need an upgrade. You know what I'm talking about? That's a problem, isn't it? There are some things you don't revisit. You've decided, it's like, nope. And, and the normal, of course, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the normal course of it. So what are we supposed to do? Make the decision. I need to offer my mind, up, my body rather, I need to offer my body up to God so that when my body is in a situation where it's committed, I'm going to stay faithful and do what it says. God says I need to offer my body as a living sacrifice to God. It means I'm offering myself to God as a living sacrifice. We've all talked about it. What's the problem with living sacrifices? They have a tendency to get up off the altar. Okay, that's something you need to sometimes just let, nope, 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 you're staying there. Because when you and I come to church and we, we, we get convicted about something, like, man, I need to do better about this. Maybe it's a habit you have or something's going on. Maybe it's your response to certain individuals and you realize, I can do better. I can show mercy. And maybe in some ways your mouth gets the best of you. Maybe you're someone who is rash and you just let it fly before you let it think. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, I, need to, I need to stop this. So, what do you, so you hear it in church, you say, Lord, and you judge yourself. Father, help me. I'm going to do better about this. I, I, I'm going to put a cork in my mouth. I'm not going to start saying something just because it comes in my head. You know, like some people said, well, I just think that if the Lord puts it in my head, I should say it. The problem is he's not putting it in your head. Amen. Right? Some of it's you. Some of it's the devil. Most of it's you. Not God. That's why you know the word. The word transforms you. It renews you. It erases those things. It gives you a new pattern of thinking. It changes you from the inside out. And yes, sometimes it's a subtle change, but thank God it's a change nonetheless. So you offer your body as a living sacrifice. 
thing about it is it's once and for all. You make a promise to God and you fulfill it. You know, the, the thing that you and I have to understand is that God is interested in commitments we make. A lot of everything in life that we hold dear upon is predicated upon a commitment. You know, God made a commitment to us. Y'all know he did, didn't he? I mean, the simple scripture that I love so much is in Romans chapter 10. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm pretty, I mean, I like that. I'm glad God's not looking to like, let's revisit that. I mean, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be bad? He's not looking to revisit that. He, he said, nope, that's it. He is the Lord. He changes not. His word is true. His word is good. And so, you know, like you and I, I'm sure we made a commitment. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. He did. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. He did. He's not looking to revisit that. That's a commitment he made. We need to follow suit and say, you know what? We can make commitments like that too. Now, now I understand we're not perfect. God is. But it shouldn't be from a lack of trying. 1 John 1, 9 says that we can ask God to forgive us. He's faithful and he's just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we do make a mistake and we realize, oh my gosh, we ask him to forgive us and he does and he wipes it all away. But it shouldn't be from a lack of trying. Isn't that right? And so what do we do? Well, we offer our bodies so that we can go ahead and become a vessel unto honor so that God can say, I can use that. You know, we all want to be, how many of you just, how many of you do enjoy eating? Yeah. Brother Wayne, do you, do you enjoy a good meal? Yeah, who doesn't? Good meals are good. You know, how many of you go to a restaurant named Dirty Plates? Y'all go to a restaurant called Dirty Plates? I wouldn't. Like, well, why do they call it Dirty Plates? And their, their motto is, we don't wash our plates because you're going to make them clean. I wouldn't go to a restaurant like that, would you? I don't know a chef that would want to put his great food upon a dirty plate. God would rather put his good stuff in a clean vessel. When I go to the kitchen to want something, you get a glass. And I'll go into the dishwasher. Now, again, my wife generally does the dishes in our house. Thank you, Jesus. And so I'll, I'll go open up there and I'll ask a question and she'll hear me. I'll yell out what? I'll say, are the dishes in the dishwasher clean? That's my saying. Are the dishes in the dishwasher clean? Daryl, do you know that expression? Have you ever used that expression? Yeah. Now, what do we do with that? We want to know because I want to know if I'm putting, if I take one of these dishes in the dishwasher, if it's clean, I want to know because I'm going to put something in it. And I want to make sure that it's clean because I want to be drinking something clean. Because I don't want to be putting something in me that's not clean. If we take that much care and concern over what we're going to put in our body physically, we ought to be taking that much more concern what we put in our lives on these other areas. Isn't that right? Next thing we need to do, offer your mind. You say, what do you mean offer my mind? Well, the Bible tells us over there in Romans chapter 12, we looked at it, how we all need to go ahead and, and have our minds renewed, verses 1 and 2. You know, beloved, I, that we should, you and I, should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable act of spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If you want to know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, you need to have your mind renewed so you can recognize it. How many of you have ever just been in a wrong spiritual state of mind in your life and couldn't recognize God if he was standing in front of you in a red dress? You know what I'm saying, right? You'd sit, I mean, you just, you, because you're not in a spiritual context. You and I, as a believer, have to make sure we are in a position where we are in fellowship with God and we are in a position looking so we can recognize the will of God. Our minds have to be renewed to what God wants it to have in it 
and how we are looking and viewing the world. You and I both know there are folks in this world that are just ugly on the inside. They need Jesus. But the sad thing about it is there's some Christians that are the same way. There are some Christians that, frankly, I mean, I'm like, my gosh. I mean, they're, they're, they're born again, but my gosh, they need some fruit. Right? And see, the thing about it is they, they, they need to be in a position to be open and available to God doing something in their lives so that they can recognize the will of God. I've had people throughout many, many years have been in the ministry, obviously, and, and, and they, they'll tell me, I just don't know the voice of God. And I'm like, okay, well, number one, the primary voice of God in your life is the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, if you don't study the Bible, meditate the Word of God. It'll be kind of hard for you to be able to perceive the will of God because this is the Word of God, the Bible. God speaking to you. Now, the way you have it is that still small voice, that intuition. You follow after that, that, that voice, that peace that you have, that passeth all understanding. You say, well, I, I just have trouble finding that. Well, the thing about it is make sure that your mind is renewed to the Word, which it should be doing, which makes you sensitive to the things God's doing in your life. You ever notice that we are, as humans, we are, we are really motivated by motion? If you're driving along, just think, think about it. If you're driving along, something's still, whatever, you don't notice, but if something's moving, your eye will avert to it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's just the way it is. You, you, you pay attention. It's like you see motion, and we're, we're, we look for motion. The thing about it is you and I as a believer need to be understanding of the fact that, you know, the, that still, small, quiet voice, we need to sensitize ourselves to see. Because oftentimes when it comes to God, He's not in the frenetic of activity. He's in that stalwart motion. And sometimes it's slow because it's constant. It's there. We need to be able to call our attention to it because guess what? He doesn't change. He's immutable. The devil's out there. He can cause distractions and disturbances and all the confusion out there. And that gets all the attention. A lot of times, that's what we gravitate towards when the will of God's sitting right over here. Right. Have you ever got distracted by drama? I'm asking, anybody ever been in all of a sudden? You know, it, it, why is it that, you know, I mean, why is it drama always gets all the attention and notoriety? You know why the news cameras are always got drama on the screen? Because that's what people, oh yeah, look at that. The news camera isn't talking about people living right, doing right, acting right. Here we are today. We're at 7040 Stout Road in Germantown, Tennessee. And we're reporting on the fact that we've got folks here living for God. <laughs> not being arrested. Committing no crimes. Killing no people going to lunch afterwards without any type of drama and tipping the servers. We'll have film at 11. You know, I mean, the, 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 people are going to watch that. On my news feed, my iPad comes up a couple days ago. It said, car chase in Los Angeles. Hit this button to watch it. I'm like, Los Angeles. I'm in Memphis. Why well, don't want to see a car chase in Los Angeles? So I clicked it. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's amazing how it's amazing how we just we want that that frenetic activity. We need to we need to be willing to follow that still small voice down in here. And, and that's the benefit of saying, Father. I want to be able to be still and quiet and to know you. Amen? <laughs> we need that transformation that only God can bring. If in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Father, tells us that we are being changed. We are being, we're being transformed by Him as we allow His glory to be reflected in our lives. 
every time we spend time with the Word, every time we hear a good message that from the Word of God and we reflect upon that and say, God, speak to me, encourage me, talk to me. Guess what? God begins to bring that and work His good pleasure in you. He reveals to you things that He wants you to know and to be able to recognize. Sometimes it'll be a situation you'll hear a scripture and, and something will just, will just ding in here and, and cause you pause. And that's something you need to put into place and begin to practice and be aware of. It may be such innocuous things that seemingly doesn't, doesn't seem to, 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 to ring you know, the, the, the sirens of, of the world. But if it's something God is trying to apply to you, take note of it. I've told the story years ago how you know I was reading the Bible and I love Proverbs and all that and, and so and I'm, I'm reading along and you know, I've told the story, but you know, I'm reading and all of a sudden, the, you know, this scripture that I'm reading that morning, it tells me that I need to be good to people, be merciful to people, be charitable to people, that if it's in my power to grant it to someone and give it to them, I need to do it. Oh, of course, Lord, hallelujah. After all, I'm a Christian, and, I, and besides that, I'm a pastor. And we all know that, that, that must give you something, right? Well, I'm minding my own business driving down the street that day, and I'm coming up on Poplar Avenue at the Interstate 240 interchange. And, of course, it's, you know, traffic's backed up. Because at that time, you're all having to merge. And there's this lane that has to exit well, on the expressway. And I'm, well, I'm, you know, I'm in the correct lane. I've told the story before. And all of a sudden, there's all these cars whizzing zoo, zoo, on that right lane over there that has to get on the expressway but they're all skipping about a half a mile of traffic and they're going to get up there and they're going to try to duck and dive in the front of the line now that just irritates me now i know brother wayne i'll be a bigger person if i was more like you i probably would just be no big deal oh come on and you know but i, I just get i say that's wrong that's not right they know what they're doing is wrong and, it, and I need to stand up for what's right. So I'm sitting there and these, you know, I'm, so, you know, they're, they're coming out all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting up there and these, this car wants to get over and I'm sitting here thinking, I'm from New Jersey. You don't know what you're up against. I'm from Jersey. I know the rules. Basic rules are, number one, never make eye contact. I learned that as, you know, learning to drive. I was told, the, 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 the driving person, you know, told me, be careful who you make eye contact with. That's what they told me. One of the basic rules of Jer Jersey driving. Because if I don't look at them, they don't know if they saw it. I saw them. If they're not sure, they're, they're going to be careful about getting over. So I just, I'm looking, I got the death grip on the steering wheel, and I'm just looking straight ahead. And then I'm driving like my dad. See, my dad, he, he, he's old school. He, he used to drive with one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brake. He did. He, I, mean, he, he, I mean, my gosh, our neck muscles were always strong. By the time we were 12, my gosh, we had strong neck muscles. I'm telling you. Other, other people had whiplash, not us. We Hollises, we had strong neck muscles. So I, I did the, you know, my, I went back to my dad's drive and I put a foot on the accelerator, a foot on the brake, and I mean, they all be proud of me. I was, I was on the bumper of the car in front of me like, mm, white on rice. And all of a sudden as I'm doing this, the Lord starts speaking to me, said, what about that verse you read this morning? And I thought, well, see, the devil can use scripture too, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh. And he, it, 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 I'll, I'll condense this story. But three times he told me. And then finally he said, are you going to do it or not? And I thought, they don't deserve it. <laughs> At that moment in time, you know, it's a van that was sitting over there. I look over like. Yeah. And got over in front. And of course, in the back was a 
you know, ichthus, and it's a Christian bumper sticker on the back of the, of the, of the, of the car. And I sat there and I thought, you know, I went through all that gymnastics when it should have been so easy that I should have just heard that and said, back off here, just let the person go. Now, I tell that story because, I mean, it's true, it happened. I mean, it's, you know, I'm calling myself out here. Now, this was some years ago. This is a long time ago. I mean, at least a week. No, no, seriously. This is a long time ago, many, many years ago. But, but the fact is, that it's situations like that that reveal that you got to make a decision every day. Are you going to do the word or not? See, what I'm saying is you can't look at it in the light of, well, they don't deserve it. We talked about mercy, didn't we? Yeah. You can't look at it like, well, it's not right. What is God telling you to do? If God's telling you to do it, you need to look at it like, okay, Lord, I need to walk in love. And see, the thing about it, it's one thing easy to say, walk in love. It's another thing to apply it in your life. It's one thing to be sitting there where you have to do something that your flesh says, don't do that. Right? That's where it really rubber meets the road. What I'm saying is if you want to be able to perceive the will of God, you've got to be able to do these things on this end to be able to graduate and hear the things that God wants to tell you. If you cannot be trusted just to do that one little tiny thing like let somebody in the traffic in front of you, when he tells you, do you know what I'm saying to you? How can he trust you with some of the way to your bigger things in life? It really is those little foxes that spoil the vines. And when it comes to faith, you know, faith is built upon faith. We talk about great faith. Great faith doesn't happen overnight. Great faith is built upon the stair steps of, of obedience to do what he tells you to do here. That makes sense? You know? Glory to God. I said glory to God. We need to renew our minds and really allow this to happen. The, 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 the new translation or the new living Bible puts it this way of Romans 12 2. I kind of like this. It's something that I think we can all grasp and understand. Romans 12 2 in the new living Bible puts it this way. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but be a new and different person with a newness in all you do and think. You ever notice that we really need to make effort and take a concerted effort not to be like everybody else? Because you're not careful. People rub off on you, not in a good way. That's all I'm trying to tell you is be smart enough to say, you know what, some of the people you hang out with, you really don't want to be like them. Right? I mean, do y'all know somebody that you that afterwards you're like, I don't, you know, you're like, I'm glad I'm not them. Anybody ever said that? Okay, that's true. But you know what? Be in a position where you can try to rub off on them. There's two things I'll share with you right here. And I know you know the difference, but one thing that we can do as a believer to help allow this to be a someone that shows compassion and mercy to others is know this. And I've said it and I'll say it again. There are two things you and I as a believer need to understand. There is a difference between these two things, ministry and fellowship. And there's some people in your life you need to understand you should not be having fellowship with, you'd rather be ministering to. So when you're spending time with them, you're not there to fellowship, you're there to be a minister, an example. You all know what I mean? Then there's some people, guess what? You can be there and you can actually have fellowship with them and be a minister to them. And that's good, isn't it? But there's some folks in your life you don't need to fellowship with because if you do, they're going to drag you down to a level you don't need to be in. You're there to be a blessing, but to be a minister, to, to be an example to them, to espouse what you believe and to live it before them so that they can see you because they're looking not just at you, but at Christ in you. Amen? And then lastly here, offer your will. Offer your will. The, the, the second part of this verse here in Romans is that we will be able to test and approve what, it, what is the will of God. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Isn't it great that God allows us to test and approve His will for us? God is not going to force you into anything. Aren't you glad? 
you know? He doesn't dominate our wills, but allows us to choose his will. I mean, God's not like your spouse. In our house, we have this little expression when my wife uses it. My wife uses it, not me. My wife. The, the wife that thou gavest me. And her expression begins with this. And I know once she says it, I know, okay, guess I guess there's something I'm, I'm I guess we're doing. These, these, th this little expression is, I'll see if she knows it. Just so you know. Right. True? Yeah, uh-huh. Just so you know. When I hear, just so you know, what, what basically this means is, you're fixing to do something and it's not open to debate. <laughs> just so you know. Now, my, my, my first response is when I hear, just so you know, is, is like, I don't really want to. I don't, I hadn't heard it, but I don't want to do it. Now it was, you know, who wants to do something when you feel like you have no choice? Right. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> Just so you know. Now, usually it's just so you know. We're going to, we're, we're going over here to do, you know, whatever. Just so you know. Folks, you and I as a believer need to offer our will to God and that when God tells us to do something, it needs to be prefaced with these words just so that you hear it this way, just so you know. Right. Just so you know. I know when I hear just so you know, you know, white flag, okay, okay. White flag, okay, we're, we're going to do this, you know. We ought to be, when we sense the will of God, when we read, God brings alive to us the scripture, we ought to just preface it like we've heard this expression, just so you know. Just give into it. Amen? Why are we fighting it? Give him our will. You know? There's, there's no use sitting around waiting to have the will of God revealed to us. This is an active verb. We need to be do, busy doing the will of God, and as we're doing that, he will reveal his will to us. A lot of times people say all the time, well, I just need to, if you'll tell me what to do, I'll go out and do it. Folks, if there are certain things you know you need to do right now, do them, and God will add more. How many of you want great faith? I mean, I'm asking, how many of you want great faith? I mean, I do. Just use what you have. Don't have the, the, the lottery syndrome when it comes to your faith. I mean, you, you know how many people say, well, Lord, you know, if I win that lottery, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do this. No, you won't. I've seen it. I've known people that have won the lottery. If they weren't givers before, they're not givers now. I knew someone back in the, in the uh, middle 80s who won a million dollars in the lottery. They bought a dollar ticket, scratched off the dollar ticket, and got $100. That $100 ticket was entered into the lottery, and they drew out of a huge bin a person was going to win a million dollars. And their ticket was pulled. And they were the same stingy folks that they were after as they were before. He goes, you know what, that, 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 it doesn't work that way. What I'm saying is we have to take steps today to become the person that we're believing for tomorrow. Does that make sense? There was a reason. I'm glad when it comes to that, like, I, I, I'll put it this way just because, it, you know, I remember, you know, being a giver. Everybody needs to be giving of their time, talents, and abilities, right? You ever know some people that just are stingy with, like, their time, talent, ability, knowledge, whatever? I mean, they just, like, you know. I was not brought up that way, you know. I'm glad my parents, as a little kid, walking into a Methodist church. I mean, you're a little tiny kid. And, and my dad's slipping me a quarter, putting a quarter in my hand. You know, I knew what it's for. It wasn't to put it in my pocket and hang on to it. Now, you know, you all know what I mean? I, I, now, you know, I remember one time, tell off on her. Remember one time after church and all that? My sister was playing around with a quarter after church. 
See, she was giving one too. And she had a quarter she was playing around with. And I looked at it and I said, where'd you get that? I said, Dad gave it to me. I said, yeah, he gave it to you to give to the church. And she's playing, but it's mine. Well, you're right, it was yours, but you were supposed to do something with it. See, just because you have something doesn't mean it really is yours. As a believer, we need to look at what we have as, as it's on loan from God. That makes sense? Your talent, your time, your attention, everything, it's on loan. God just loaned it to you. Every day is a gift. I was talking, and we'll close here, I was talking to one of the, one of the folks in our church here not long ago, and we were talking about certain individuals that had passed away just, you know, suddenly and younger. I mean, just, you know. And, and, and yet, you don't know. I mean, every day you have to look at it as a gift. Every day. Every day you wake up, never take it for granted. Before you go to bed, just thank the Father. Father, I thank you again. And I, you know, just tell him, I did the best I could today, and I, I appreciate you giving me another day, and, and, and let's do even better tomorrow. Offer your will to him. Let him know you belong to him. Let him know it's okay for him to tell you just so you know. Say, Lord, I, I want to hear though. I want you to tell me just so you know. I want to do something with you and for you. I want to do something that furthers your, your, your kingdom on this earth. Amen? If we'll do that, then guess what will happen? We can sit there and have an expectation that we're going to wake up the next day. And we can say, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't matter what others are or are not doing. What matters is I'm going to serve God. I'm not going to let other people's unbelief make my faith of no effect. That's basically the fancy way of bringing it around to what your mom told you as a kid. Remember how it was when you were doing something because all the other kids were too? And then they, and your mom told you, remember? Yeah, exactly right. Well, if, you, if they all jumped off a bridge, would you jump off of it too? That's the same thing that you're basically, on a spiritual sense, just because everybody else is doing something that's wrong doesn't mean you should be. Right? Have a proper estimate of yourself. The scripture I'll leave you on is right here, and I'll close. You look at the verses 3 and 5, as it were. I'll read it to you. It says here, For by the grace given unto me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you should, but rather to yourself, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the measure of faith God's given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, who are many from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Folks, we are really connected to each other. We need to recognize that, you know what, as God has dealt to us, we need to walk and function in that capacity. And so, you know, don't look at someone else longingly as if they have it better than you. No, they have it for them. You have what God gave you to do. Now ma maximize it. Live, live it to fulfillment and potential. You'll find out that if you'll do that, you'll be blessed. I raised my kid with this one saying, because he played, you know, he played sports in areas, you know, and bowling, and that's a sport. Be nice. <laughs> we did football, and he's more cheerleader than football player. We did, I, I coached that. I coached baseball, coached pitch. I mean, basketball. I did every sport trying to expose him to sports. And I remember I came home one day and my wife looked at me and said, Honey, I think you're just going to have to resign yourself to the fact that he isn't an athlete. You know? And I just said, Get thee behind me. Hallelujah. You know? But we found, we found that a sport that he was good at and loved, it was bowling. He excelled in it. But the thing about it is, I try to tell you, he, had, he just, you know, he was really good. Young age, won the city championship at little uh, at all at not quite twelve years of age. He was eleven years of age, almost twelve. Won the city championship, beat everybody. Kids that were twenty one, he beat them. You know, he did that twice actually. Did it later, a couple years later too. But anyway, but I told him something. I said, "Son, you know, he come up to you. 
he, he's like, well, so-and-so, you know, I said, you're always going to find someone better than you. They may have, a, they may have more of this or that or whatever, maybe taller, stronger, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing you'd always need to remember. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And so you're in a situation just like that. God's given you grace and given you a measure of faith. He's given you something to use. And you know what? And, and, and you, you might look at someone else that they seemingly have more. But you know what? That doesn't really matter because you're not them. And secondly, you need to maximize what you have. And I go back to the same saying, and that is that hard work will beat talent when talent doesn't work hard. Just because someone may have more of something, if they don't, are not faithful over it and give it to the hand of God to use and allow him to bless it and grow and mature in it, does them no good at all. You take somebody who has a little bit, even as a grain of mustard seed, and God, when he blesses it, can make it flourish and manifest into something that is something to behold. Give God something to work with and you'll be amazed at what he gives you back in return. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you got something out of this today. Try to encourage you a little bit in light of what we've looked at the last couple of weeks. Hallelujah. God is good and his mercy endureth forever. Glory to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for all that you've done. You're a God that is more than enough and we're so grateful and so appreciative that you have chosen to make, make all of us here a part of your family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the preciousness of your love and of the sacrifice that, that you allowed your son to make on the cross of Calvary. Father, we mentioned it a moment ago, you said in your word that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Father, thank you so much for honoring that commitment of being a God that is truly a, a, a God of your word. I, I just pray though, Father, is anyone listening to, to maybe this message and these words that Father, and maybe, maybe they're unsure, unclear, whether or not they've accepted the Lord Jesus. Maybe they don't know they're going to spend eternity in heaven with you. And I pray right now that they're just checking their heart out and realizing that there is but one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. You said in your word in Romans 10 that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Heavenly Father, I pray right now if there's anybody yet to do that, listening to this message, online or, or even here. Father, I thank you that all they need to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of all my sins. I love you and I want to serve you. Come into my heart in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Help us to be able to be, to be receptive to your word to the leading of your spirit. Help us, Father, to present our body as a living sacrifice and to allow your word to remain in us. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, for those of you joining us online, I appreciate you taking the time. I pray that this day becomes a great day for you. And so if there's something we can do for you, if you don't mind, just reach out to us, the information on the screen of how you can do that. Also. If, if you'd like to be a blessing to this church in ministry with your financial giving, on the screen are some ways you can do that, and we thank you for it. After all, your faithfulness is, is something that we value and we thank you. But we also know something else. God said in his word that we are indeed reapers of what we sow. It's kind of nice because that gives us encouragement that as we sow good things, we receive good things. Kind of something to shout about and be glad about. And so for that, we just say thank you ever so much. Again, we welcome you to come back here Sunday morning, 9.30, 10.30, or Wednesday at 7 p.m. Until we see you again real soon, always remember, God does love you. He cares desperately for you. And that Jesus is Lord. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now.